Hello and welcome to the Physio Channel. In this video, we're going to discuss physical therapy and rehabilitation for long COVID. Behind the COVID-dominated headlines of positive tests, daily death rates, and the R number, we find a building discussion of a phenomenon referred to as long COVID. In this video, I'll explain what the scientific community currently know about long COVID and the role of rehabilitation. If you are a sufferer of long COVID, scientifically termed post-acute COVID-19, you may find this video helpful, and I've put some other useful links in the description below, or as a PDF download if you're watching this on the Teachable platform. Since the beginning of the pandemic, some people have reported ongoing symptoms and what is often described as an inability to bounce back. They remain trapped in a state of partial recovery, sometimes for many months. And this clinical presentation has historically been poorly understood. The term used to describe this clinical presentation is post-acute COVID-19 for symptoms beyond three weeks and chronic COVID-19 for symptoms extending beyond 12 weeks. The media uses the term long COVID to describe and include both of these terms. Well, initial data suggested that 10% of sufferers experienced ongoing symptoms beyond three weeks. But the data from the UK Office of National Statistics reports around 20% of their respondents still experience symptoms after five weeks and 10% after 12 weeks. Well, risk factors are not yet known because of a lack of data to identify correlational patterns. It has been suggested that certain symptom clusters indicate a higher risk of long COVID. It's important to note that the symptoms can continue after a seemingly mild initial virus and are not limited to those experiencing a more severe acute illness. So you don't have to be hospitalized to be at risk of longer term symptoms. The term long COVID suggests that the virus remains for longer, but this is likely not the case. The prolonged symptoms continue after the virus has left, and in many cases, there may be no test results to confirm that the individual had the initial virus in the first place. And it's for this reason that it's generally acceptable to give a diagnosis of post-acute COVID-19 without a previous positive test. Clinical diagnosis is often based on the presence of a cluster of symptoms that may vary between individuals. This array of ill-defined symptoms include cough, fatigue, headaches, muscle aches, breathlessness, chest heaviness, and heart palpitations. And of course, one of the key symptoms of the initial virus is a loss of sense of taste and smell, and this can continue with post-acute COVID-19. Patients have also described symptoms such as brain fog and lung burn. These symptoms can fluctuate, so there may be signs of recovery and a return to some normal daily tasks, like returning to work, for example, but there is then a return of the symptoms met with a decline in function and a withdrawal from normal daily life again. And it's this waxing and waning or boom and bust pattern, which is a common characteristic that many post-acute sufferers need help with and we'll discuss just that in this video. Now, in terms of comparison, in many cases, the presentation is very similar to chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. As a result, data from the management of those conditions has been extrapolated for long-term COVID management. So if you have a patient with post-acute COVID-19, where do you start? Well, they should have or have had an assessment from their doctor who will likely take into account any pre-existing COVID health issues, the severity of the initial virus, whether they were ventilated, hospitalized, or experienced any specific heart or lung problems. Some patients may require specialist tests and a specialist referral. However, it's generally agreed that most sufferers of long COVID will recover without the need for specialist referral but that is not to say they don't need specialist help, advice, and management. If you have regular contact with this patient or client, you may find yourself being part of their recovery team. And this video outlines what you can do to help. Mm -hmm. 
To help you identify any serious symptoms even after they've been assessed by the doctor, just be mindful of any new symptoms that emerge. These could include breathlessness, headache, loss of sensation, loss of power, confusion, heart palpitations and chest pain. These symptoms are common, but if they're not common and present as new symptoms, then the patient should visit their doctor or if severe, seek more immediate medical attention. Now, if the patient is using pulse oximetry or you've been monitoring it, then it should be above 96%, unless it was initially lower due to lung disease. A drop of 3% or more requires further assessment, even without evidence of a change in their breathlessness. Quiet, relaxed breathing should occur through the nose with minimal upper chest and shoulder movement and with the diaphragm performing the majority of the work of breathing. As a respiratory virus, COVID-19 can trigger a change in the breathing pattern due to labored breathing. This can cause a reduction in diaphragmatic breathing and an increase in neck and shoulder movement and muscle tone. This pattern is often referred to as paradoxical breathing pattern, a pattern of chest puffing rather than abdominal expansion. Poor breathing technique can contribute to a variety of symptoms. Breathing through your nose filters the air and reduces upper airway irritation. Diaphragmatic, also known as abdominal breathing, also prevents shallow breathing. And shallow and rapid breathing can lead to a reduction in carbon dioxide in the blood, which causes, among other things, symptoms such as fatigue, brain fog, and heart palpitations, symptoms that COVID sufferers routinely report. So teaching correct breathing patterns and techniques and restoring a normal pattern is a key component of post-acute COVID management. We'll cut now to a breathing technique video and above is a link to the respiratory function videos on the Physio channel. I've also put a link in the description below and I'll put a video again at the end of this one. So let's take a look at this next video on breathing techniques. Number one, sit in a relaxed position or you could lie down supine. The overall aim is to make sure your chest has minimal movement. For your lower hand, you first want to check that your abdomen is rising as you breathe in and monitor that motion. You don't need to force anything or tense anything. Remember, it's just normal, natural breathing. So even if you need to correct your pattern, just becoming aware of your correct pattern and knowing what it should be is often enough to start correcting the pattern without too much conscious effort. You could try to apply a bit of extra pressure through your lower hand into your abdomen to make the brain more aware of this area. This may encourage the diaphragm to work a bit harder, but you need to be careful that you're not pushing too hard or trying to push your hand away by contracting your abdominals. That simply won't work. In fact, you need to keep your abdominal muscles relaxed because bracing your core can make life harder for your diaphragm to contract. In fact, bracing the core during normal daily tasks is one of those bits of advice that is now outdated and often makes things worse for people. We want movement and bracing is not movement. Because the diaphragm-led expansion is in all directions, you can also try placing your hands, again, just around your lower ribs so you can feel that lateral expansion. And this feeling and feedback through your hands can help to re-educate your breathing pattern movement. Just feeling and having an awareness of what the aim is can start to bring about some positive pattern changes. Now, number two. So breathing is a unique function because it's automatic and essential to life, but we can bring it under our conscious control. We can stop it, we can speed it up, and we can slow our breathing down. For this next technique, the aim is to engage in short periods of slower breathing, particularly slowing the out breath. Try this. Breathe in through your nose in a relaxed manner, but don't make the breath deeper than usual. Next, breathe out through pursed lips. As you can see from the image on the screen here, the aim is to breathe in for three seconds and out for at least six seconds. This will take practice for most of you, 
but aim for 10 breathing cycles each time. Sometimes when people try to slow their breath like this, it can make them anxious. This is not helpful at all. So if you find this occurs for you, simply reduce the intensity of the exercise by allowing yourself to exhale a little quicker at first, maybe four or five seconds. This allows you to get used to the exercise, makes you less anxious about performing the technique. Number three, if you are a habitual chest breather, then this technique can restrict your ability to expand your chest and lift your shoulders by actively holding them down. Here's what you do. Sit in a chair, uh, ideally one with armrests, set to the right height. If you don't have a chair, then what you can do is just push down through your thighs. It's not quite as good, but it can still help with this technique. Push your arms down into the armrests so that when you breathe, your shoulders are not able to rise up because you are pushing down into the armrests. You can then focus on abdominal breathing and feeling the expansion around the abdomen. So the fourth technique is to combine all three techniques in one. Seated, hand placement over the chest and abdomen, slower nasal, and pursed lip exhalation, which is twice as long as the in-breath. With the correct positioning as well, you should be able to combine all of these with the shoulder depression down into the armrests, which limits the upper chest expansion. If you're finding this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up, and when you're finished, consider sharing it with anyone else that you think may be interested to see it. Experiencing unaccustomed breathlessness with previously manageable exertion can be frightening and lead to activity avoidance or rushing to complete tasks like dressing or going upstairs. Breathlessness can be managed by acknowledging the tasks that cause it and the current capacity for activity. The tasks then need to be planned and paced. For example, dressing may need to be completed in two parts, fitting socks and lower body clothing first, followed by a short break to stabilize your breathing before putting on your upper body clothes. With walking, for example, you might need to start by doing individual laps around the house before venturing away from your home for longer walks. The management of fatigue is perhaps the most difficult symptom to manage as it affects so many areas of life. Pacing is the most important management tool. The patient needs to acknowledge the limitations that the fatigue is forcing upon them. And this is difficult, but important because fighting against fatigue seems to just make it worse. Equally, overcompensating and trying to catch up with life too quickly on a good day can lead to a relapse. There needs to be a form of accommodation and compromise. So if you're suffering from long COVID and fatigue, you will need to reduce your basic level of daily activity, sometimes by a considerable level, in order to avoid repeated burnouts and disappointments. In addition to pacing, here are some other tools for managing fatigue. Keeping an activity diary and noting daily activity and symptoms is a good way to acknowledge the symptoms and identify any potential patterns that may work or not work for you. Setting goals based on current ability and modifying them with any symptom changes is an important way to manage fatigue. Make sure the goals are broken down into smaller tasks and write them down, keeping them easily visible on a piece of paper, which increases the chances of completing them. Now, some of my previous patients suffering from fatigue have used the following goals as examples. Getting washed and dressed before a set time each day, or performing specific exercises like six sets of stair climbing at home with three minutes rest between efforts. Another patient was walking around the block, planning to walk around one block one week and walk around two blocks the next week. These are just some examples of things that my patients have done, but it really depends on the individual and it's important to remember that the achievements, no matter how small, are important for other aspects of well-being, including mental health. Another thing you can do is reduce commitments. Having something to get back to, like social commitments or work, often serve as motivations for recovery, but they can cause stress and relapse if an individual is fighting fatigue to return to these things too quickly. So negotiating a phased return to work and 
delegating other tasks will free up energy for recovery. And it's doing this, which is often one of the most difficult parts of handling ongoing fatigue. Next, prioritize. Many things can sap our energy during the day and lead to fatigue. When you know energy is limited, it makes sense to plan to use it for important and enjoyable tasks. For example, if you've been going for a walk each day, but on this particular day you need to go shopping, then the shopping trip should take priority. And of course, it may involve a similar step count to your routine walk anyway. But trying to do both may leave you excessively fatigued at the end of the day and put you at a risk of a relapse. It's also important to look after your general health. Fatigue and recovery will be supported by paying attention to your general health and well-being. This could include avoiding excessive caffeine and alcohol, maintaining a good diet, getting adequate sleep, resting and relaxing sufficiently, and also maintaining social contacts and engaging in enjoyable activities. It's important to think about both physical and mental health for general well-being. Next, we'll consider exercise. Graded and progressive exercise plans should be used with caution and not prescribed in a protocol type format. Previous attempts to engage chronic fatigue and chronic pain patient groups in progressive exercise plans has often backfired and led to a backlash against well-intentioned professionals. Exercise should be introduced in small increments and response is monitored on an individual basis with no resistance to cutting back on exercise volume or intensity if required. The good news is current data suggests that recovery from post-acute COVID will occur naturally with time. As mentioned in this video, you still need to monitor for any new specific symptoms and recovery can be potentially sped up with the holistic approach outlined in this video. So what about the athlete or sports person? To answer this question, we can refer to the post-COVID-19 Rehabilitation Consensus Statement released by the UK Defence Medical Rehabilitation Centre, Stanford Hall. I'll make reference to the first version in this video, but it may have been updated since. So you can check out the link and the reference in the description below or on the PDF download. Following recovery from a mild illness without hospitalisation or cardiac symptoms, a sports person should limit training to low level stretching and strengthening, but not cardiovascular training for the first week at least. While suffering from the virus, if the symptoms are very mild, then low level activity like slow walking can be completed. Of course, high intensity exercise should be avoided. For persistent symptoms, any activity should be limited to 60% of maximum heart rate for two to three weeks after the symptoms have cleared. Now, patients who required oxygen during the initial virus will require a more in-depth respiratory assessment prior to commencing intensive training. Patients who had cardiac symptoms also require a full cardiac assessment before commencing training. And any patient with confirmed myocarditis will require three to six months of complete rest from sport and training and physical occupations. Older patients are at a higher risk of muscle loss and chronic pain with post-acute COVID-19. This may be due to a more severe initial illness or due to a generally higher risk of sarcopenia and persistent pain prior to infection. Exercise can potentially help reduce sarcopenia and manage pain if done correctly. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. You may also find some of the other videos showing on the screen here helpful or of interest. Please leave a comment below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this and consider sharing it with anyone else who you think may find it of interest.